The liquidator of Busasa and Gupta-owned Shiva Uranium, Kluta Murray, has died in hospital. He was shot while traveling with his son along the N1 highway near Midrand yesterday. Murray was then rushed to hospital in a critical condition while his son Thomas died on the scene. No arrests have been made in connection with the suspected hit. Police said they're investigating two counts of murder. Let's talk more about the story. We're joined tonight by Accountability Now Director, Advocate Paul Hoffman. Advocate Hoffman, a very good evening to you. Always good to speak to you. So, Business Day running an article this afternoon saying that others in the same industry, basically rescue workers, business rescue workers, as well as insolvency experts, are now alarmed at what they believe was a targeted hit. Are they right to feel as though they're under threat or increasingly unsafe? Yes, uh, good evening, Tembakili, and good evening to your viewers as well. I think this shocking incident, and one's heart goes out to the widow, uh, the, uh, the mother of the, the youngster who was uh, shot so brutally on the highway. Uh, the, the effect of it is a rather chilling one for professionals who find themselves up against those who have enjoyed corruption with impunity for so long in South Africa. Uh, if it's a professional hit as would seem to be the case in all of the media speculation that I've seen, then it means that South Africa is heading towards the status of a gangster state. And we really don't need that when we've been grey-listed, when we've been downgraded, and when we've had the state capture report and its recommendations. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm distressed by the news and I'm worried about its ramifications in relation to the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. But at this point, in terms of just being responsible, even in dealing with the story, you made the point yourself, much of what's being reported is either rumor, speculation, or supposition. We don't know yet what the motive for a hit would have been in this case. Yes, it might even be a case of mistaken identity for all we know at this stage, but the probabilities point in the direction of uh, the deliberate taking out of the uh, uh, Bertie Murray and his son. If it was or if it is a hit, as is now feared, how then do we ensure people who are called in, such as Mr. Murray would have been at the end of some of these processes and companies that have been involved in allegations of massive corruption, that people, professionals who want to come in and do good work, feel safe and protected? Yes, I'm afraid they're going to have to make security arrangements. They're going to have to um, be, be careful about when they are in vulnerable positions. And they are, they're really going to have to upgrade. It, it doesn't appear that there was any security around uh, Mr. Murray and his son. And uh, that's something that people in, in uh, exposed positions are going to have to reconsider. That's what happens in gangster states, unfortunately. But it also, this case, speaks to just how brazen criminals in this country have become, doesn't it, when you consider that a father and son were basically murdered in broad daylight on a public road. Yes, it's, it's that culture of impunity which is feeling a little bit threatened by the moves towards reform, which we will talk about presently, I hope, and that atmosphere is, is making those involved in the, the sort of investigative work and the liquidation work and the business rescue work that uh, Mr. Murray was involved in. They feel vulnerable themselves and they feel that they have to uh, make arrangements that are a little bit more unorthodox in order to avoid the, uh, the, the, con the accountability for what they have done and in order to extend their period of immunity from being held accountable for the irregularities or the crimes that have been committed uh, leading to the liquidations and business rescues of, of the companies with which he worked. Let's come now to the submission that you've made to Parliament, a proposal basically for the establishment of another Chapter 9 institution to help fight corruption in South Africa. What would it do that is different from the existing entities and would it perhaps be able to assist in matters such as what we're discussing tonight? Yes, I think that it would be able to do so. 
We are suggesting that for serious corruption, and we think that 5 million rand is a suitable cutoff point, so anything over 5 million rand should be entrusted to a specialist body of suitably trained uh, personnel who are structurally and operationally independent, who enjoy secure tenure of office and are resourced in a guaranteed fashion. We feel that that is what is required in order to uh, reform the criminal justice administration so as to render it effective and efficient against serious corruption. We didn't make up these criteria. These criteria were prescribed by the Constitutional Court in the second Glenister case 11 years and two days ago. So it's quite, it's quite, sorry, 12 years and two days ago. It's quite a long time for the government to get to the point where it makes the reasonable decision of a reasonable decision maker in the circumstances, which is what the court said was required. We've been without proper uh, anti-corruption machinery, which is why there's such a huge backlog, which is why the people involved in state capture are, are either running free or languishing in jails, but not uh, in court and not convicted. Those aspects of South African life need to be addressed because it's public money that has been stolen. And when public money is stolen, it is the poor that suffer. The, the, the money required to properly roll out the human rights guaranteed to all in the uh, Bill of Rights just isn't available. And that's why there's uh, so much poverty and inequality in South Africa. And indeed joblessness too, because new investment doesn't come when people think that their money is going to be stolen and they're not going to be able to get it back. But the obvious question with such a proposal is, why not take that money and direct it to some of the other anti-corruption bodies that are already struggling because they have issues around budget? For example, the NPA has complained that because of issues around budgeting, it's unable to get through all its workload. So why not direct the funds that would go to another Chapter 9 institution to those efforts? Yes, I, I, I see that as a uh, really a false problem because if there is proper recovery of loot, the, the new institution will be able to pay for itself out of the loot that is recovered many times over. We know that somewhere between one and three trillion rand is involved in state capture. That is much more money than has ever been recovered by the the Hawks or the NPA or even the SIU. And if you have an efficient and effective outfit doing the necessary work, then the cost involved is not the problem. It is the political will to address uh, corruption that is being conducted with impunity in South Africa that is the problem. Generating that political will is something that is is required if this is going to be a constitutional democracy under the rule of law. The, the, the criteria prescribed by the court, not nice to have or something that you could consider, they binding criteria that have to be put in place if the law is properly implemented. It's Parliament's job to oversee proper imp implementation of the law and it's the executive's job to see to it that the court orders binding on the state are actually obeyed. You can't just treat a court order as if it is a nice to have. It's not. It's, it's, it's a binding uh, decision that needs to be implemented. Advocate Paul Hoffman, good to speak to you. Thank you very much. Director at Accountability Now.